Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. This show isn't for kids, which I mention only so the babies out there will know that their personal information may be being collected by whatever platform they're listening on. What's up, you cool baby? I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today we will be talking about the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED51. So, we're talking about COPPA. What is COPPA? When COPPA started entering the news uh, late last year, I thought to myself, like, wait a minute, haven't I heard of this before? Like, where is this from? Yes, COPPA is not a new law. This isn't a... a There are new developments, uh, and we'll get to those in a minute. But um, yeah, this law has been in effect for 20 years now. Um, I was seven years old when it came into effect. So pretty much my entire like online experience has been affected by COPPA. So the law essentially says that online services cannot collect personal information on kids who are under the age of 13 without their parents' permission. So... Personal information here includes everything from like tracking that kid via browser cookies in order to give them like personalized ads, uh, all the way to allowing that child to um, post like in a comment field uh, where they might disclose their own personal information to other users. Um, All kinds of things like that would fall under um, collecting personal information from a kid. So yeah, this this law is why so many websites have like an age check when you are first creating an account, um, because if they allowed kids to use their website, then they would have to treat um, pretty much all users as though they were children. Uh, And so it is far simpler to simply just ban children under 13 from using their website um, than it is to like try to go and get parental consent for only the users who are under 13. So thinking back on my own childhood, uh, I really have to wonder how like RuneScape survived because everybody who I knew who was playing the game was definitely under 13 and we definitely had lots of opportunities to disclose our own personal information to uh, other players. Uh, But that's besides the point. So COPPA applies to any sites or services that are directed to children, um, which means that like it's it's, it's a site that is meant for kids to visit and to use Um, or it applies to sites that are directed to a general audience but that the owners the operators of that website know that they are collecting information from kids so i guess first question is how do you determine if a site is directed to children or not? Uh, the FTC, um, Federal Trade Commission, they're the ones who are in charge of enforcing COPPA. They have a list of different things to look at in order to determine if a site is uh, directed to children. Um, so the subject matter, the visual content, the use of animated characters or child-oriented activities and incentives, the kind of music or other audio content, the age of models, the presence of child celebrities or celebrities who appeal to children, language or other characteristics of the site, whether advertising that promotes the site or that appears on the site is directed to children, and if the site has competent and reliable empirical evidence about the age of their audience. Uh, Those are the main categories that the FTC uses in order to determine if an online service is directed to children or not. Now, there are a lot of criticisms of COPPA, uh, including that the proliferation of age checks online just encourages kids to lie about their age. I'm sure that none of us have ever done that. And also that the lengthy process of like getting parental consent often ends up with kids going and uh, instead of using a, a website that is directed to children that has child-oriented and appropriate activities, um, those children might just give up uh, because they have to go and get parental consent and, uh, and they might just you know end up on other websites that aren't really meant for kids and may not be appropriate. Now, there are a lot of other uh, criticisms of COPPA, but uh, we'll 
we'll swing back around to criticisms uh, when, once we've talked a little bit about why COPPA is in the news today. Over the last 20 years, uh, the FTC has brought action against quite a few companies uh, regarding COPPA violations. The largest two both happened in 2019. Um, so early in the year, $5.7 million fine was uh, given to ByteDance, who are the owners of TikTok. Um, and they were also required, in addition to that $5.7 million fine, uh, they were also required to add a kids-only mode to the app. And then later in the year, uh, in September, it was announced that um, YouTube had been fined for $170 million and uh, and they they got caught for like tracking the viewing history and other things for for minors uh, in order to serve them targeted advertising. Uh, in addition to that uh, one $170 million fine, uh, YouTube will also be changing how it treats content that is directed at children um, and also the viewers of that content, of course. And so this is why we're talking about COPPA today, because uh, those changes that YouTube has to make uh, are quite substantially changing like the way that uh, creators have to interact with the platform. A few things that are definitely notable about uh, the settlement that uh, that YouTube and the FTC reached, um, that is 30 times larger than any other single COPPA penalty to date. And it is also 10 times larger than all the other COPPA penalties to date combined. So that's it is an order of magnitude larger than uh, all of the other COPPA violations, which is like, that is insane. That's wild. Um, this is, yeah, it, it's a huge, it's a huge number. It's also interesting to note that the FTC commission voted 3-2 uh, along party lines to authorize this complaint. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why. I can't, I, I've, I've been looking at this case for a while and like I can't exactly identify what it is about it that makes it a partisan issue. Um, so that's just an interesting thing to note. So this brings us to discussing what is changing on YouTube. Um, so videos that are on YouTube will now be labeled as either made for kids or not made for kids. Important to note, this isn't saying that like the content is unsuitable for children to see. That's what like the age restriction setting is for, where you can restrict videos to be like 18 plus. Um, the the made for kids or not made for kids label literally just means like are children the main intended audience for this video. So. If a video has been marked as child-oriented, right, if it's been marked as made for kids, then that means that everyone who is viewing that video will be treated as though they were under 13. And so no personal information will be collected about anybody who is viewing those videos. And that means that some features will be disabled for those videos. So uh, we will no longer have autoplay available, cards and end screens, channel branding watermarks, channel memberships, donate buttons, personalized ads, comments, live chat, notifications, and save to playlist or save to watch later. Those will no longer appear on videos that, um, that have been marked as uh, for kids. And like YouTube created that list of features based on which features require YouTube to gather personal information from a user in order to implement those features. Also, if a channel has marked themselves as being child-oriented like across the entire channel, then uh, that channel will no longer have uh, channel memberships, they won't have a notification bell, they won't be able to like do um, community posts, and they won't also won't have stories anymore. So, how are these videos and channels being marked as either for kids or not for kids? Um, the creators themselves, the people who own these YouTube channels, right, are responsible for marking each video as either made for kids 
or not. And like I said, you can either, you know, as a creator, um, you can set this either on a channel-wide basis so that every single video that you upload will have one uh, setting or the other, uh, or you can go and do it on a video by video basis. So the purpose of that setting, this is the most important note right here. The purpose of that setting in the eyes of COPPA, the way that the FTC is viewing this, is that the content creators are telling YouTube whether or not to collect information about the viewers of those videos on behalf of the channel. So COPPA applies differently to content creators versus third-party ad services. Um, so content creators are always liable for COPPA if they make content directed to kids. But any third parties are liable only if they have actual knowledge that the websites they are serving the ads to are child directed. Um, so what this means uh, is that the these new mechanisms that YouTube has built, you know, where creators are marking each of their videos as either directed at kids or not, um, that is YouTube's mechanism for having knowledge about which videos are directed to kids and which ones are not. So YouTube, the platform, the company, would be liable if they collected personal information on the viewers of the videos that a channel owner has marked as being for kids. But a channel owner is liable if they upload a video that is directed to children but label it as not for kids. And so this is the thing that is like really, really clever about the the solution that YouTube came up with. I assume that it's YouTube that came up with this solution and that it wasn't like the FTC that directly told them how to implement this because um, the result here is that YouTube essentially is no longer going to have to worry about uh, being liable for COPPA violations anymore. Now the liability rests with the content creators themselves. So anyone who uploads a video to YouTube and fails to properly market um, as child-oriented or not um, could be fined up to $42,000 per video. And that number, like, the, the fine is, in general, like, kind of, it scales with, like, how, according to how much money you are making on that video. And the FTC is planning on, you know, really closely monitoring the situation and, like, in their words, doing a sweep of YouTube content um, now that this new system has been put in place. it's It's been in place since January 6th. Um, so the FTC is going to be, uh, you know... Taking a look at a lot of a lot of YouTube videos and seeing like, okay, this one was marked as not for kids, but is it really? Um, and uh, the FTC's director of the Bureau of Consumer Protections uh, referred to this as like shooting fish in a barrel, where uh, the barrel is YouTube and all of the uh, channel operators are the fish. And he's saying that like it's going to be much easier for the FTC to find all of these videos and and catch uh, people who are you know uploading content um, and, and that is meant for kids and uh, and you know then not marking it correctly um, he's saying that it's much easier for the FTC to do that because uh, it's all in this one centralized platform as opposed to you know if each of these uh, content creators had to go out and like create their own websites and um, you know market that and get that content out to kids uh, and then still collect personal information on the kids. But yeah, referring to like the process of uh, finding and fining individual content creators as uh, shooting fish in a barrel does not sound like a very charitable stance. Now, of course, there are a lot of videos uh, that were uploaded to YouTube before these tools were put into place. And, uh, you know, not everybody is, like, monitoring all of the channels that they uh, own and operate. And so uh, YouTube has used some machine learning to try to detect whether uh, each video is child-oriented or not. 
I'm sure that that process went very well. Um, but yeah, channel operators can correct mislabeled videos and then YouTube uh, will not override that that setting uh, unless they detect like that there's been abuse or that uh, that there's an error that happened. Um, so for the most part, like uh, even for older videos, it's entirely up to the content creators to set them as either meant for children or not meant for children. So all of this, this uh, situation has resulted in a lot of uproar from the YouTuber community. Some of these concerns have to do with the like features that are being uh, taken away from videos that are meant for kids. Um, so for example, reduced income, right? Personalized ads make way, way more money than the like context-based ads that will be placed on child-oriented videos from now on. So a lot of creators are worried that like, okay, if I if I happen to be somebody who makes a lot of child-oriented content, uh, how am I going to be able to afford to continue to do that uh, if I can't make as much money anymore? Um, there's also some concern that videos will plummet in like the algorithmic recommendation system because engagement and having early viewers are huge factors for the algorithm. Um, and uh, you'll note that both like notifications and um, most types of like engagement with the video are disabled for kid oriented videos. We don't know for sure that this will happen, though, that uh, kid-oriented videos will be recommended less often um, because, like, YouTube knows that these changes are happening and the people at YouTube are probably smart enough to have thought of this and, and I expect that they'll probably adjust the algorithm accordingly to allow, you know, good quality uh, kid-oriented content to still be recommended to their viewers. I've heard some content creators uh, claiming that these kid-oriented videos will no longer show up in YouTube search. That's definitely not true. And also, a lot of people are concerned that, like, hey, there's some stuffy government agency that, like, are they really equipped to tell which videos are intended for kids and which ones are, like, intended for teens or adults but contain things like maybe, I don't know, Minecraft footage or um, stuff about, like, a cartoon that, you know, like, is... On, on the face of it, you might look at it and say, oh, yeah, that's a kid-oriented cartoon, but, like, oh, you know, there's actually a lot of stuff in there that um, that appeals to all ages, right? And so if I make a video that's talking about that cartoon, like, you know, will it be seen as being uh, something that's intended for kids? Um, is, is a government agency really, like, the best equipped to determine whether which stuff is going to appeal to kids and which ones is, is meant for adults. Um, and I guess, I mean, to that point, I would say that like the FTC has been doing this for like 20 years, right? They have experience with like lots of websites and online services. This whole adults who are into things that like traditionally kids might be into, like that's not a new phenomenon. So I don't I don't see that being uh, the the end of the world, right? Um, I'm I suppose there will probably be like missteps, of course, but um, yeah, the the FTC uh, even in their own documents they assure us that they like they understand that these cases are commonplace and that they carefully consider them. Um, so if a t if a video is made for like a teen or an adult audience, but children also happen to watch it and enjoy it, um, that doesn't mean that the uh, video is liable under COPPA. Um, but uh, yeah, at the same time, I mean, I think back to that whole like fish in a barrel comment and like, that's wild. So I don't know what stance exactly like the FTC is going to take on these things. Now, uh, on YouTube's part, they have announced that in order to combat the like drop in uh, revenue for kid-oriented channels, um, YouTube will continue investing in the future of quality kids, family, and educational content by establishing a $100 million fund dedicated to the creation of 
thoughtful, original children's content. Um, but honestly, this won't help creators who like make content for a general audience um, in a way that may appeal to kids as well as adults. So if a content creator like feels really nervous about being liable for COPPA and being caught in, in that $42,000 per video fine, um, you know, they like you might end up making content that really is for a general audience, but you might not get like the full revenue from it because you've marked it as for kids, but YouTube probably won't still won't be interested in giving you money from that $100 million fund because they might not view it as actually being like for kids. Um, so yeah, there's, there's several different entities here pulling in different directions and like who determines like what is for a kid in different cases is going to be kind of like tricky and probably very messy. Some speculation on my part. Um, so the way that YouTube is currently like cre treating content directed to children, um, i.e. turning off features in order to avoid collecting data on those kids, um, that isn't the only way that they could address this. They could implement a system that allows kids who are viewing those videos to like create accounts and then obtain parental consent to collect personal information. Um, you know, YouTube, or not YouTube, but Google has experience uh, doing that because they like, uh, for your Google Play account, right, they allow people who are under 13 to create accounts there and then they have to get parental consent to like use that account for most purposes and uh, and Google like knows how to implement that kind of system they know how to verify that it is an adult who is giving uh, giving that consent um, but uh, the only reason that I can think of that like YouTube would want to do something like that is if content creators really feel the hurt uh, in terms of like you know missing out on all these features and if a bunch of them complain to YouTube um, then YouTube might uh, implement a system like that. All right, let's talk a little bit more about some of the criticisms for both COPPA itself and also for this uh, current situation that we find ourselves in regarding COPPA. So um, one of the most salient like criticisms that I saw while reading into this current situation is that YouTube the platform, YouTube the company, they're the ones who have been collecting personal information on kids and like video creators themselves don't have access to that data and yet content creators are now the ones who can be fined by the FTC for COPPA violations going forward. Um, so yeah, like that, that take is one that I saw uh, repeated in a couple of different places, and it made a lot of sense at the time. Um, but the the way the framing, the way that I I understand it now that I have gone and dug into like the actual FTC documents and watching their um, press conference on this, is that um, yeah, the reason that that content creators are now liable, it's because the COPPA like is treating each individual YouTube channel as though they are their own online services, right? So creating a YouTube channel is now equivalent in the eyes of the law as like creating your own website online, right? Um, if I went and created my own website where I want to host my podcast episodes and it's all for kids, maybe, you know, I call it podforkids.com or something like that. I expect that most of my audience is children, then I can't like legally collect personal information from my audience. And if I have like advertisements on my website or in my uh, podcasts, then I also have to make sure that whatever services I am using to insert those ads into my podcast or onto my website, right? I have to make sure that that ad service also is not collecting personal information from my listeners from my visitors and so that's kind of the the role that youtube is now playing in this situation content creators youtubers right are the ones who like own their own little websites their own little per or online services and 
YouTube is now like just an ad service, right? They're the hosting platform. And so, yeah, by having this new setting, um, that is how the channel operators, the content creators uh, are setting uh, their channel to either collect information from their viewers or not. Um, so that's the reason that like content creators are now liable for this. Another criticism is that uh, the features that are like disabled versus the features that are still available for kids' content is a little bit confusing. For example, how come a viewer can still like subscribe to a channel that's meant for kids, but they can't use like the notification bell or even save videos to a playlist? That seems very strange. I don't understand why like adding stuff to a playlist requires Google to collect personal information from a viewer, but subscribing to a channel does not require them to do that. Like, both of those require you to have an account and everything, but I don't know. Much smarter people than I who work at YouTube, I'm sure, have uh, been the ones who are thinking about all this. A criticism for COPPA in general is that, like, having only websites that make content for kids be the ones who have to follow this law is, you know, it, that doesn't really protect children from, like, having their personal information collected because, like, any time that a kid is watching a video or visiting a website that is meant for a general audience... Um, that, you know, that kid is, their, their personal information is going to be collected just like everybody else's. So, yeah, this, this, this law isn't really preventing the thing that it's designed to prevent. Uh, and so I, th I think, yeah, the FTC probably needs to find a different way to, like, enforce it. Also, there are a lot of other things on YouTube that, like, might threaten a kid's safety, um, and COPPA, like, does nothing to address any of those. So we've heard a lot over the last couple of years about, like, you know, really weird algorithmically generated videos making their way onto, like, the YouTube Kids app, or, like, um, videos that seem like they're made for kids, but then, like, in the middle of it, they spliced in, like, stuff like instructions on how to commit suicide or whatever that kind of thing yeah it's like COPPA of, of course was not designed to address any of that and um you know we would have to write some new laws to like come up with a solution for those kinds of things um but it's it's still you know it's like it seems like we're kind of addressing the really small insignificant things uh, with, you know, with regards to COPPA um, when there's like real big problems out there. And then finally, yeah, the onerous requirements of COPPA make it so difficult to create content for kids that we're probably not getting as many like really good kid oriented things made and distributed online as uh, as we could. Um, there's no doubt some like really good stuff out there that's being stifled that can't be created because either they can't make enough money doing it or um, because like the way that that it would have to work is you know they would have to collect information on uh, on their viewers in some way. So yeah. There are a few unanswered questions, um, even after, like, you know, having this new system in place for about a month now. Um, there's, there's still a few things that we don't really know how they're going to shake out. Like I said, we don't really know how this is going to be affecting, like, kids' videos being recommended to viewers. We also don't really know who the FTC will ultimately come after. We know that like the FTC doesn't have unlimited resources, of course, um, but uh, so they. I find it very likely that they'll focus on like high-profile YouTubers who are trying to cheat the system. Um, I expect that like most of us who you know are like aren't making gobs of money off of uh, our YouTube channels will probably be fine. But yeah, remember not to take anything that I say as legal advice. We don't know whether, like, the FTC will care more about, like, the actual contents of a video or, like, the title and thumbnail that the audience sees before they watch the video. I could see it going either way because, like, you know, the actual contents of the video is what really matters, right? But you could definitely make the argument that, okay, kids aren't going to know whether something is, like, meant for them or not based on 
having watched the video already, they're going to make that decision based on like what they see in the title and what they see in the thumbnail. And so like, yeah, I could, I could definitely see the FTC kind of weighting that more heavily in their decisions. We also don't know if this is kind of an example of like how the FTC will be treating other platforms that host user-generated content. Uh, will we be seeing other platforms requiring users to mark content as either directed to children or not in order to avoid liability? Totally possible. This, I mean, this was a huge historic uh, like precedent in, in the, the COPPA space, right? This was the biggest case that uh, the FTC has ever brought against a company. So um, yeah, other companies that host lots and lots of like creator-generated content probably are paying a lot of close attention to like how this is shaking out. And so yeah, we might see ripple effects uh, in other places as well. So here are the lessons that I'm taking away from all of this research that I did on COPPA. Um, number one, I don't think it's going to be as bad as some content creators have made it out to be. Um, like, there, there was a lot of hubbub, especially from, like, the gaming YouTubing community, because, uh, you know, of course, a lot of the games that people cover and, like, make content based on, right? So, like, Minecraft or Roblox or whatever, right? Those are games that definitely appeal to kids, but also definitely appeal to adults. And um, so there's been a lot of kind of, you know, people being unsure of whether they need to start marking all of their content as being for kids or not. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, my takeaway is that, okay, as long as you are making like a good faith judgment about who your content is intended for and who you are targeting when you like title your video and make your thumbnail and everything, then you're probably going to be fine. As usual, I've noticed that the whole like YouTube is over genre is the only thing that can unite all YouTubers, which it just delights me. Personally, of course, I'm not very concerned about uh, my own work because like it's all technology focused podcasts. It's all like really long form. Um, I can barely even get my like high school students to uh, sit down long enough to listen to a couple of my podcast episodes for them to learn the actual things that they're supposed to be learning about in class. Um, so I can't imagine that like any uh, kids 12 and under are going to be uh, very interested in, uh, in the content on the Nexus TV. Also, like anybody who is making enough money from their content creation in order to be doing it like full time, they should definitely have a lawyer on hand to help answer questions uh, about things like this. Um, because, you know, of course, there's not just COPPA, but there's also lots of like copyright law and, you know, all kinds of other things that you have to deal with when creating content as your career. Um, so, yeah, if, if you're if you're making like enough money at this, then like you should have your own business set up and you should have figured out uh, kind of scaffolding, right? Like systems in place uh, to help you manage this kind of thing. Um, if you are somebody who uploads like, you know, videos to YouTube and you're not intending on like making money off of this or anything, you know, and you're not like relying on any of the features that are being turned off for kids content. I mean, I guess you might as well just mark all of your videos as being for kids. It seems really silly, but like, I mean, if you want to 100% avoid being liable to the FTC for copper regulations, then like marking your videos as being intended for kids is how you do that. Um, and I mean, hopefully, like currently checking that box doesn't even like submit your video as being something that like could go into the YouTube Kids app, but like down the road, if YouTube decides to do that, then we might get some like weird sticking points. Um, I don't know. It would be nice to have just like a, a, a box that's like, okay, this is for kids, this is not for kids, but then also a third box that says, this is not for kids, but also don't collect the personal information from any of my viewers. <laughs> but YouTube is not uh, provided with us with one of those buttons. And then uh, the last couple of lessons that I'm taking away from all this are just kind of general things about the uh, structure of the internet. Um, like maybe we shouldn't all be relying on these giant centralized walled garden publishing platforms to handle all of our stuff. Um, specifically, like I think relying on your hosting platform 
in order to both generate revenue for yourself and also to like publicize your content, that was probably a bad call. Um, I don't know how we really like reverse this though, because like anybody who wants to get a large enough audience uh, in order to make some money, whether it's through the platform directly or by selling ads through some other means like um, YouTube is kind of the only user generated video platform that is big enough to like matter uh, at this point. And so like I, th I feel like we're kind of in a catch 22 now. Also, like, so we built a world for ourselves where, like, everybody is both a consumer and a creator and where everybody is kind of a, like a de facto small business owner. Uh, maybe that was too good to be true. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, last thing I'd like to mention before we uh, sign off for this episode is that um, simultaneous to like all of these YouTube changes happening, the FTC was also in the process of like revisiting the COPPA rule. Um, they revisit it every 10 years um, and they decided to do it a little bit early uh, right now because they, you know, there's a lot of like emerging technologies and new technologies um, that they realized that they needed to kind of address those in different ways than what they've been doing up until now. So for example, think like voice command assistance, right? How should those treat audio files of like a user giving commands um, if the user is under 13? How do we expect those companies that are operating these smart assistants to like know whether a user is under 13 or not, et cetera, et cetera, right? Those are the kinds of questions that like the FTC was asking uh, when they started revising um, their, their rule set. Um, and of course, like because this was happening at the same time that YouTube was announcing the, the new um, system that they put in place for marking uh, videos as for kids or not, um, a whole bunch of YouTubers encourage their viewers to go and flood the public comments uh, in order to try to like get the rules changed so that content creators aren't held liable. Um, but I, I mean, that wasn't really what the process was supposed to be about in the first place. So I don't know exactly how that's going to shake out. Um, but I, I wouldn't expect that process to like reverse all of this stuff that is happening on YouTube right now. Um, because that's more about like brand new and upcoming technologies that the FTC is trying to uh, get in front of and, and you know figure out how they're going to treat those. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Extra Dimension. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. Uh, this episode is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, which means that you can use any part of it as, as you see fit, as long as you uh, link back to the original page, which is thenexus.tv slash TED51. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, you can go to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. And if you are willing and able to support us financially as we continue to make technology-focused podcasts, you can join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash thenexustv. And if you listen to this episode within like the first week or so of when uh, it was published, uh, you can actually join us for a little giveaway on Patreon. Uh, so everybody who uh, supports us on Patreon before February 16th, that's Sunday, February 16th, um, everybody will get entered into a drawing for a Google Nest Mini, which uh, is the product that I reviewed just a couple of weeks ago on Second Opinion, our review use show. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.